Well, good morning. Welcome to a rainy Tuesday morning. Glad you're here. Um, as you well know, this week is election week, and so we're going to pray for that in just a second. But I uh, also want to let you know this is week nine of 11 weeks, so there's two weeks to go. Uh, this week, we're going to look at uh, the first half of Job's speeches. And, and they're not really speeches. They're, they're more, it's like he's on trial and he's defending himself. But he's going he's gonna to speak for 19 chapters. Now, we're not going to look at everything he said. That's impossible. But uh, we're going to take part of the chapters this week. And then we're going to take the second part of the, the chapters next week just to see what he said. And uh, so I'm going to pray for us. We're going to jump into it. And then the final week we're going to do, how does God wrap up this whole thing? What does God have to say about all the madness, all the things that have been said about him? And it's going to be the greatest way to end this book as far as I'm concerned. So let me pray for us and we'll jump into it this morning. Thank you, Father, for this chance to come together on this rainy Tuesday. And I thank you for the rain. I thank you for the cooler weather. Lord, we we come before you and we pray that your will be done in all things. And that includes what happens this evening and into tomorrow. Lord, we don't know what's gonna happen. And we pray your will be done. And regardless of what happens, we know your will will be done. Uh, and, and so we pray that you would help us to see you in it, that we would reflect on you, trust in you, hope in you, that our confidence would be in you no matter what happens. And Father, may we understand that you are at work in ways that we can understand, just like in the life of Job. And so Father, may we trust you and may we rest in you. May we have peace and may we wake up tomorrow with confidence that you're still on your throne and you're working your plan to perfection. And I pray all of this in Jesus Christ's name, amen. All right, so we're gonna take a look at Job. Um, I don't know about you, but if, if I were Job, I, I've, I've thought about how would I respond? And, and I don't think it could be put in the Bible. Um, I, I don't think it would be appropriate. But I think I would be pretty hacked at this point. And all these, dis, these conversations, and again, they're not really conversations, they're diatribes. These uh, three friends and then Elihu all piling on poor Job. And he's got to somehow respond to them. And he does respond for 19 chapters. He, he's, he's always letting them finish. And then he says, okay, now it's my turn. And so we're going to look at part one of all his responses. And again, we can't look at all of them. And I don't think it's important necessary to, necessarily to look at everything he said. But it is important to understand that what he said, as far as God's concerned, is, is right. Um, he, it's, it's right words rightly spoken, um, but they sound wrong. It's almost the opposite of his friends because his friends say a lot of godly sounding, scriptural sounding things, but at the end of the book, God says, well, they're wrong. Everything they've said about me is not right. But what we have to remember is that with Job, it's a different story. God said of him just the opposite. Chapter 42, verse seven, my anger, God says, burns against you, Eliphaz, and your two buddies, Bildad and Zophar, for you have not spoken to me what is right as my servant Job has. Now, when I read that um, in, in preparation for this whole series, it really kind of shocked me. I don't know if I'd never seen it before, but it never struck me like it did at that moment to think that, wait a minute, I've, I've read what he said. And a lot of it sounds pretty dicey. A lot of it sounds heretical. A lot of it sounds like you can't talk to God that, that way. That's inappropriate, that's, that's offensive to God to talk that way. But the more I've studied it, the more I've looked at it, and the, and the more I've looked at like the Psalms of David, I've realized it's really okay to talk to God that way. It, it sounds disrespectful, it, it sounds disobedient in a way, even heretical, but at no point in the book does God ever really reprimand him for the things he says. Now he does let him know that You've, you've drawn some wrong conclusions, but he never condemns him. He, he never gets angry at him. If anything, he blesses him. That's how the book ends. So what's going on here? How, how, how is it that what Job says is right and everything his friend says is wrong? And what I've tried to do is boil this down into some, some pretty practical things that I hope will help you like it's helped me. See, what he says, I love the way the NIV translates it. You have not spoken the truth about me. 
That's what he says to Eliphaz, Bildad, and Zophar. You, you're not telling the truth about me. So if you take the opposite, you're telling lies about me. You think you're speaking about me. You think you're um, accurate, right, but you're wrong. It's, it's falsehood. The Berean Study Bible puts it this way. You have not spoken about me accurately. Uh, that one's kind of scary, right? To, to ever think that you might say something about God that is not accurate, that is not true, right, faithful to scripture. And the truth is we do it pretty frequently. Uh, we don't mean to, but we, we say things. And again, it, it could be something we heard from a sermon years ago. It could be from a Sunday school teacher. We get it from all kinds of places, but we say something that is not accurate when it comes to the character of God. And, and, and that is a dangerous thing to do. The NASB says, you have not spoken of me what is trustworthy. In other words, it, it can't be trusted. It can't be used. It's not helpful. It's harmful. So we've seen that as we looked at all of these guys, the four guys, Bildad, Zophar, Eliphaz, and Elihu, that what they've said is not right, but Job has said what's right. Again, 19 chapters. That's a lot of space to screw it up, to say the wrong thing. You give me that much space, and I'm going to probably err on some occasion when it comes to God. But from what God says, that everything he said in those 19 chapters about him is right. And this is the guy that these four supposed friends have accused Job of these things. They've called him a fool, a windbag, wicked, ignorant, a mocker, self-righteous, unrepentant, impure, and heretical. I mean, that's what they've done for the entirety of the book. And yet God says, what he has said about me is right. And if you've read their, their conversations with Job, every time Job defends himself, they go, you're a liar. You're, you're wrong. You're, you're, a, you're a heretic. You're, you're blasphemous. You're, you're a sinner. You, you've committed some atrocious sin. That's why you're suffering. And they've repeatedly said that. But God says, everything this guy has said is right when it comes to me. And that, that really made me kind of step back and go, well, why? What, what makes what he says truth? Why is it trustworthy? Why is it faithful? Why is it accurate? And I think it has everything to do with his, his character. You remember chapter one and chapter two, consider my servant Job. He's blameless, upright, fears me, and turns from evil. There's something about the character of this man that God knows about that makes what he says, the way he says it, okay with God. And I think that's what we have to discover because he said some really questionable things. Now, one of the things that you have to remember is that he's got two audiences he's dealing with as he speaks. And it's really kind of hard at times to figure out, is he talking to God or is he talking to them? And it goes back and forth. And within the same little speech, he'll address them, He'll address him, he'll talk to himself and then he'll talk to God. He's the only character that we, we see who prays. So he's gonna address his friends and he's gonna do it in succession. So Eliphaz speaks and then Job responds. Zophar speaks, God, uh, Job responds. But he's also gonna talk to God. And this is significant because I find no place in those sinner chapters where any of his friends ever talk to God. They talk about God, they just don't talk to God. They've never prayed for Job. They've never put their hands on him and, and prayed for him. They've, they've never lifted him up to God. They've never sought God's wisdom. They just speak as if they already have it. So it, two audiences, his friends and God. And then second thing, there's three different things or styles that he uses in his speech, which again are hard to, to see because they kind of blend in and out but you're gonna see that he's gonna defend himself repeatedly. Why? Because they're attacking him. And he's gonna say, no, you're wrong. That's not right. I didn't say that. I didn't do that. I'm not guilty. I'm innocent. So he's gonna spend a lot of time defending himself. Then he's gonna lament. He's just gonna, woe is me. And I can relate to this part, right? I'm, I'm good at lamenting. When things don't go well for me, I, I can lament with the best of them. I, I can moan and groan and grouse and complain. And, you know, I can't believe this is happening. I don't need this. It, this is horrible. And, you know, for me, it's, it's silly stuff. 
it, it, I, I make much out of nothing. So, so we're uh, redoing our upstairs bathroom. And, and for the life of me, I don't know why I'm doing this because we just finished doing our downstairs bathroom, which was a royal nightmare. But my wife convinced me, the woman, she. And, and so we're, we're redoing our, our upstairs bathroom. And everything's been going great, but we took a you know, bath combination, kind of an old fashioned tub with shower and we converted that into a walk-in shower. Wonderful, great. Well, they hung the doors, everything looks wonderful. And then they discovered they hung them wrong. So they had to take it all down and then redo the tile where they drilled all the holes and then put it up again. And then yesterday morning, the contractor comes out and he goes, it's still wrong. So he took it down and now I've got, they've got to replace all the tile again. And he discovers that it can't be hung. It's just not right for that space. So it, I, get, I get really angry about that kind of stuff. I'm like, this is so frustrating. We should be done by now. I can't believe you're, can nobody do their job right? And everybody's blaming the other person. This is the kind of stuff I lament about. You're talking first world problems, right? That your shower door is not quite right. That, that your, the paint was wrong on the ceiling. It's, it's silly stuff that irritates me beyond belief. But I'm, I will take that to God. Lord, I don't need this right now. I can't believe this is happening. We need this done. We've got company coming. We've got to have that room done. And, and I, I almost hear God going, really? That's your problem? That's what you're going to bring to me? That's what you're going to moan about? But see, poor Job's going to lament, lament about real problems. And then he's going to take it to God. He's going to take his problems to God. And the sad thing is, well, it's not sad because it involves God. God never answers him until the end. And he never does answer 90% of his questions. He's going to lament, he's going to pray, and then God's going to remain silent for all of the book until the very end. And we'll look at that in the last week. So let's talk about the self-defense. How does he defend himself? And rightfully so, he feels like I've got to defend himself because he's got all these friends attacking him. So here's just some of the things he says, and we're going to run through some scripture. Just, just follow along with me and catch, catch an idea of why he's so upset. He says, one should be kind to a fainting friend. I love, I love this. This is the New Living Translation. It, hey, I thought you were my friends. I expected you to be here to encourage me and to walk beside me and pray for me. That's what I expect. That's what a friend does for a fainting friend. But you accuse me without any fear of the Almighty. My brothers, you have proved as unreliable as a seasonal brook that overflows its banks in the spring when it is swollen with ice and melting with snow. You, you have not blessed me, you have inundated me. You have flooded me with attacks and with just misery. You've, you've actually made my life worse. But I think they're thinking, well, no, we're here to help. We're, we're trying to help you repent so that you can get restored. And he's like, well, it ain't working and it's not helping. Then he says this, honest words can be painful, but what do your criticism amount to? See, he, he says, you're not honest. You're not being honest. You're just criticizing. You're, you're beating me down. So do you think your words are convincing when you disregard my cry of desperation? And over and over again, he keeps telling them, I haven't done anything. I'm not guilty. I'm innocent. But they, they refuse to accept his testimony. And they just keep hammering him. So he defends himself. He says, stop assuming my guilt, for I have done no wrong. Do you think I'm lying? Don't I know the difference between right and wrong? Am I an idiot? Am I a moron? Do I not know my life? I don't think Job is afraid to admit wrong. He just can't think of what he did wrong. And so he's like, I, I'm going to hold to my guns. And again, he agrees with God. He doesn't know what God said about him, but God said he's blameless. He's upright, not sinless, but he walks before God. He stays confessed up. And so he says, I, I, I don't know what I've done, but you keep telling me I've done something wrong. You've assumed my guilt over and over again. And he says, I am just, I'm blameless. What he doesn't know is that he's agreeing with God. He's basically saying, this is who I am. I, I haven't done anything wrong. And they're saying, no, you're just the opposite. And he says, you smear me with lies. And you know this had to offend Bildad and Eliphaz and Elihu and Zophar. And they're like, how dare you? 
And this is why they get so angry and they get more and more angry as the chapters go on. He says, your platitudes are as valuable as ashes. Um, Your words are, are trash. They don't work. They're platitudes. They're pious sounding little verses you throw out. It's like what you and I can end up doing without really knowing it, that when somebody's suffering, we quote a verse. We usually quote it out of context. We don't know what it means. It's never applied to our life. We just know that sounds like a good verse and I'm gonna share it with you and then I'm gonna walk away. That's what he says. I don't need your platitudes. I don't need your pious sounding words. I need your empathy, compassion. But what do you do? You smear me, you, you attack me. He goes on and says, I'm not godless. If I were, I could stand before him. He, 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 I could not stand before him. He says, if I were guilty, as you say I am, then I have no right to stand before God. But what does he do? And we're gonna see it. He's gonna, he's gonna come repeatedly say, Lord, give me a chance to come before you. Allow me to stand before you. And he's saying, guys, would I beg for that? Would I wanna stand before a holy, righteous God if I was guilty? No, I, I wouldn't wanna get anywhere near that God. But he says, I keep calling out to God. And every prayer this guy prays, they hear. That's what's amazing. He prays and he prays right in front of them to God and they ignore his prayers and they act like you're blasphemous. Again, I've done no wrong and my prayer is pure. Every prayer I pray is pure. I'm not doing it for you. I'm not trying to press you. I'm I'm trying to let God know that I need to be vindicated. I want to be healed. And he, he goes on and he'll say some things like, if I have sinned and I'm just ignorant of it, show it to me and then forgive me because that's the kind of God I believe in. He's, he's, he's got some wrong ideas about God, but not nearly as wrong as his friends. And he believes he's guiltless. As for all of you, Bildad, Zophar, Elihu, all of them. As for all of you, come back with a better argument, though I still won't find a wise man among you. I love this one. This is my kind of guy. You know, a little bit of sarcasm, a little bit of, a little bit of an attack. And I, and I would have lit these guys up. I, I would have called them all kinds of names, but he's holding back. He, but he says, you guys, there's not a wise man among you. You brag, you you you. Obviously, you, you, you just, you're hot air. You're just nothing but hot air. The very thing they accused him of. But he says, I cry out help, but no one answers me. I protest, but there's no justice. So you, you get the idea that this guy is frustrated. He's angry. He, he doesn't understand why his friends won't support him. And as far as he can probably tell by now, you're really not my friends, you're my enemy. But he, can't, he also can't understand why God won't speak up. Why won't God answer his prayers? But again, in these, these verses, he's attacking his friends, defending himself. How dare you go on persecuting me saying it's his own fault? How dare you? What right do you have to speak into my life and accuse me of things you, you know nothing about? And then they've actually said, and you deserve worse. You deserve to die. You deserve the worst God can bring. But he says, how can your empty cliches comfort me? All your explanations are lies. There's no love lost between these guys, right? At this point, they may have sat with him for seven days and seven nights in silence, but now they've opened their mouths. They've declared their theology. They, they've shared their views of Job and he's fed up. He's had enough. Your explanations, all your pontification is wrong. See, he's endured a smear campaign a long lasting smear campaign. I have no idea how long this took. I don't know if this is one day. I don't know if it's three months, three years. The scriptures don't tell us how long this went on. I tend to think it it was just a matter of days. Over and over again, smearing the character and the name of this man. They questioned his righteousness. They maligned his testimony about himself, about his God because they've reached a point where they have a different God than he, he has. They, they don't think he should be praying to this God because this God doesn't listen. Their God looks down and goes, I don't want anything to do with you. As a matter of fact, I don't, I don't need to have anything to do with anybody, righteous or unrighteous. See, their God is distant, aloof, removed, transcendent, not eminent. He's, he's not part of Job's life. He's really not a part of their lives because he's too great for that. Remember we looked at that last week? 
with Elihu that his God is great, but he's great only in the sense that he's great enough to punish you. And he's gonna keep punishing you until you turn around. Otherwise, he's gonna have to kill you. They've sullied his reputation. You remember this guy was considered righteous, not just by God, but by his peers, his, his, uh, the citizens of his community. Everybody looked to him. He was wise, he was righteous, he was good, he was godly, he gave to the poor, he helped the needy. He, he did all kinds of things, but they have repeatedly drug his name and his reputation through the mud calling him wicked and unrighteous and evil and blasphemous and all of these things. And he's had to sit there and listen to it. And they've minimized his pain. What's amazing to me is that none of these guys ever go, man, I can't believe you're still alive with everything you've been through. I can't believe the suffering you've had to endure. I don't understand it. I I wouldn't wish it on my worst enemy, but man, I'm gonna walk with you through this. At no point do they ever understand, seem to understand how great his suffering is. They just minimize it. And they tell him that you really deserve more. And then they take that suffering and they weaponize it. And they say, your suffering is the wrath of God being poured out for your unrighteousness. And he's gonna keep doing it until you finally confess and repent or he's gonna kill you. That's their God. But see, his God is different. And the one thing I hope we see over these next two weeks is that he continues to hope in his God. That's why he keeps praying. There, 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 it seems like there would come a point where he goes, okay, I'm done. I, I'm, I'm done with you. I'm done with him. I, I, I'm not gonna pray anymore because he will not answer my prayer. Remember what Satan said to God, if you'll just let me attack him, I'll get him to curse your name. And he never does. He keeps calling out. He keeps crying to God. He has hope in God, but they trivialize it. They, they, oh, you're gonna call out to God? You think God's gonna answer you? Well, not your God, Elihu and Eliphaz and Bildad and Zophar, but my God answers prayer. My God is compassionate. My God is merciful. See, there's something there. There's a glimmer of hope all through these, what, 19 chapters. As Job responds to his friends, as he laments and and even talks to himself. And then as he calls out to God, he cries out because he believes that his God will help. And see, that's the mark of somebody that has a relationship with God. When you go through suffering, you may say, why now? Why me? Why not her? Why not him? I don't need this. I, can't, I, I don't deserve this. You may say all kinds of things that sound uh, unspiritual, unfaithful, unholy, but you're crying out. You still believe God's there. You still believe God can help. You're confused by his lack of answer, but you have not turned and walked away from him. See, that's what it means to curse God is that you basically say, screw you, God, I'm done. And you walk away, no more. I'm fed up with you. Job never does that. He continues to cry out and he's angry, justifiably angry. See, that's the thing that we have to realize is that He is angry. Elihu was angry, right? It says he burned with anger at Job. He burned with anger at his friends. He burned with anger, but it's not a righteous indignation. He's just angry because they can't seem to get it right. This guy is angry because he's lost his 10 kids. He's lost his health. He's lost his wealth. He's lost his reputation. He's got four supposed friends who continue to attack him and denigrate him and and he's angry because he can't understand why this is happening. Now he's still got the same kind of theology as his friends that God rewards the righteous and he punishes the wicked. That's why he's angry. I'm not wicked, so why am I suffering? But again, his anger doesn't prevent him from calling out to God. All his friends have become his enemies. He looks around and he goes, I don't need you. I don't even want you. Why don't you just go home? Uh, You're not helping me, so I'm better off without you. And I think he would love for all four to pack their stuff and go back to wherever they came from. But that's not how he feels about God. His, His advocates, these men who should have supported him, have known him for years. They're all up in years except Elihu. They've known him. And rather than advocate, being advocates for him, they've become his adversary attacking him, demeaning him, questioning him, throwing him under the bus repeatedly over and over again. But he knows 
somewhere in his heart, he understands that God is not my adversary. I love this from Dan Daniel Estes. He says, as Job listens to them, his four friends, he becomes increasingly upset. By this point in the book, Job regards his friends as hostile mockers by what they say. He finds no hope in them. Even when his friends have failed him, Job more and more has to turn to God. That's a rough one for me. When you can't depend on your friends, your godly Christian friends to support you, you have to remember, I, I, I can still turn to the Lord. And what makes that hard is that I can see my friends, right? Right? They're, they're flesh and blood. They, they can put their arms around, around me and, and show me affection and they can pray for me and they can encourage me. But when they don't, I have to turn to the Lord who I can't see. I, I can't feel his hug. I, I can't feel his affection. I, I, I don't know if he's there or not there most of the time, but what I think God is doing with Job is he's, he's saying, you still got me. You can't depend on them, but you can depend on me. And I think that's the point God wants to bring every guy in this room is, is where your hope is in him. And I'm gonna keep bringing this up. And I know I, I make some of you angry, but if you're hoping in this election, I pity you. I really do. Because it doesn't matter what happens. And I really do believe this. It doesn't matter what happens. God's will is gonna be done. And if you wake up tomorrow morning and you are angry, anxious, frustrated, upset, then you really have to step back and go, how great is my God? How good is my God? See, what God wanted is for Job to keep coming to me. They're gonna keep attacking you. They're gonna keep questioning you, but you can come to me. But one of the things we have to do when we're suffering is we have to go through this process of lamentation. We have to express our sorrow. And when he's not defending, he's lamenting. And one of the things I want you to understand this morning is that it's okay to lament. It's okay to mourn. It's okay to get angry. It's okay to get frustrated, to question, to doubt, to fear, to wonder. But you got to take it to the Lord. And ultimately, he will take it to the Lord. Because if, if all you do is lament, woe is me, I can't believe this is happening to me. If it's just belly button gazing, over and over and over again, that is not helpful. It will get you nowhere. But if that lamenting allows you to then go to the Lord and say, I don't know what to do, that's a good thing. And I think some of us in the room are afraid to be honest with God. We don't wanna tell God how we feel. But isn't it amazing that the God of the universe who knows all things and knows what you're thinking before you think it, knows what you're gonna say before you say it, it's okay for you to tell him how you feel because he already knows how you feel. He just wants you to say it. It's a form of confession. I'm angry, God. I'm frustrated. Hey, go read the Psalms of David. David, David did it repeatedly. He would, he would start out a Psalm and he'd go, where are you? Why have you left me? Why have you forsaken me? Where are you, what, have, what have you done? Where are you, why won't you help? And then about halfway through, he goes, but I know this. You're a good, gracious, loving God. You're my rock, my strong tower. You're my fortress. You're my shield. And by the time he gets to the end, he goes, I'm gonna trust you. I don't like it. I don't understand it, but I know I can trust you. See, that's the model we should use. It's okay to lament when you're sad and you're hurting, you're confused. And tomorrow morning, you're gonna, some of you may be that. You may be sad, confused, and hurting, and you're gonna have to take that to the Lord and say, I don't get it, I don't like it, but I'm gonna trust you. I'm gonna rest in you. Because his world didn't make sense anymore. Not just his earthly world, but his theological world. It had been rocked because his God seems to be unjust. His God seems to be unfair. He's suffering when he shouldn't be suffering. So his whole theological worldview has been shaken. And it's okay to take that to the Lord and go, Lord, I don't understand what's happening in our world. I don't understand why this side seems to be winning and this side seems to be losing and the good seem to be suffering and, and the wicked seem to be prospering. I don't understand that. You know what? That's been going on for centuries. And our God is fully aware. And, and when we inform him of that, he never goes, really? I didn't know. Thanks for cluing me in. I was busy on another planet. Whatever we may think, he's here. He knows he's in charge. He has a plan. He's working the plan. He puts kings on thrones. He takes them off the thrones. 
that's our God. But this guy was wrestling because his concept of God had taken a hit. He's struggling. And your concept of God often takes a hit. The question is, what do you do with it? Well, he's going to lament. And lament is a prayer expressing sorrow, pain, or confusion. It's just stating what you feel. I can't believe this is happening. I'm so frustrated. I can't, this, it's, it's, you may weep. You may cry out in anger. You may mourn, complain, grouse, moan. Lamenting takes a lot of forms. And it's not always a prayer. I don't always lament through prayer. I just lament. And, and, and I let it out, and especially if I'm by myself. If, if nobody's else in the room, I lament pretty loudly. I rarely pray out loud, but I lament out loud. Are you kidding me? Now? Really? This is your plan for me? What, what kind of... I, I want everybody... Well, I don't want everybody to hear, but I want God to hear. I'm not addressing him, but I certainly want him to hear because I want him to know how I feel. And the funny thing is, God already knows. I think he just wants me to just, it's, I call it verbal vomit. You just get it out. You know, I hate to vomit, but once I do, I feel better. And I think there's something good about getting it out of our system and saying what we're feeling. See, I love this from Lamentations. It says, for all these things, a whole book based on Lamentations, <laughs> mourning and sorrow. For all these things, I weep. Baka, that's that word. Tears flow down my cheeks. No one is here to comfort me. Any who might encourage me are far away. Don't you know this is how Job felt? He's surrounded by friends, but it's like there's nobody here to comfort me. Not even my God is comforting me. And so your laments, my laments may not sound like a prayer, but they really are a cry. And guess who hears all our cries? God Almighty. You know, in the book of Exodus, when Moses gets called, God tells Moses that I've heard their cry. Whose cry? The people of Israel. I find no place in the book of Exodus where they cried out to Yahweh. They were crying out. They were crying out to false gods. They were just crying out to one another. They were crying out. But God says, I heard their cry and I'm going to answer. Every time you cry out, God hears. Every time you cry out, when you lament, when you moan, when you grouse, when you complain, God hears it. And God is not offended by it but he wants you to know I'm hearing and I'm listening. See, I love this from Psalm 38. David says, I'm bent over and racked with pain. All day long, I walk around filled with grief. A raging fever burns within me and my health is broken. I'm exhausted and completely crushed. My groans come from an anguished heart. This is honesty. This is a prayer. This is David expressing that this is how I feel. This is my reality. And, and the worst thing you can do is go to God and say, oh, God, you're a great, good God, and everything's wonderful. Thank you for my life, and everything's blown up in your life. And he's like, really? That, you're going to fake it with me? You're going to act like I don't know what's going on in your life, that I'm not sovereign over all things? Will you not just be honest for once in your life and express how you feel? See, it's okay to do that, but we're uncomfortable with that. I get uncomfortable reading the 19 chapters that Job speaks because I go, ooh, I kind of want to say that, but you can't talk to God like that. And Job would say, oh, yeah, you can. I did it for 19 chapters. I love this, Psalm 42. Day and night I have only tears for food while my enemies continually taunt me. He goes on in verse four. My heart is breaking as I remember how it used to be. One of the things we see in these chapters that Job is going to look back and he's going to, remember, and he's going to reminisce. I remember when I was thought to, thought to be righteous. I remember when I had 10 healthy children. I remember when I had wealth and health and everything was going great. I remember, but now it's this. And it's okay to tell God that. I, I remember when life was better. I remember when my marriage was uh, healthier, when, when my kids were not in rebellion, when, when my finances were in a better state. I remember those days and God goes, yeah, I know you do. And I know you hate where you are right now, but you know what? I'm still in control. I know what I'm doing and I've got you. I, I've got a plan for you. But see, he was willing to say, my heart breaks. My, I, I'm brokenhearted. I can't believe this is happening because he's gone through some really tough stuff, guys, right? We, we, we can't gloss over. We can't do like his friends did and minimize his suffering. Listen to what he says. I don't have the strength to endure. I have nothing to live for. 
I, I thank God have never reached that point in my life, but I, I know people who have. I've done funerals for people who've taken their lives, who really reached the point where I, I don't have anything to live for anymore. This, this, I know people who've gone through this, and you know people who've gone through this. Maybe you've gone through that. He goes, I'm innocent, but it makes no difference to me. I despise my life. That, that is like the saddest thing I've ever heard. I know I'm innocent, but it doesn't matter because I hate my life. I, I, I hate the way things are going, and I don't know what to do about it. Here's another one. Whatever happens, I will be found guilty, so what's the use of trying? Man, that is like the pits of depression. That, that is just, I give up. I, I have reached this point. You know, back in the mid 80s when I had my, my own ad agency and I was on the verge of bankruptcy, there were mornings I got up and I, this is exactly how I felt. What's the use of trying? Why go to work? There's no business. I, 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 I don't have any income coming in. I can't, I can't even afford to buy food for my kids. And I was, I was at the lowest part of my emotional life at that point. So I, I can get this. And then he says, I wish you would hide me in the grave and shield. In other words, I wish I would just die and forget me there until your anger is past. Just kill me. God, just whatever you're gonna do, do it. Get it over with so that your anger will finally pass. Because as long as he's alive, he feels like that anger is just gonna continue. See, this is his reality. This is what he feels. It, it's, it's his everyday life. He goes, my spirit is crushed. My life is nearly snuffed out. The grave is ready to receive me. And for him, the grave is not die, go to heaven. It's die, go to Sheol, a black hole, nothingness. Life is over. So you can see the, the lamenting that's going on because he indeed is crushed. And then he says in chapter 17, verse 15, where then is my hope? Wonderful question, right? It's the question you need to ask tomorrow morning, regardless of what happens. So like if, if, if it goes the way you want it to go and you wake up and all the results are in and you're like, yes. Ask the question, where is my hope? If it's the opposite and everything has gone south and your world has cratered because it didn't go the way you wanted, ask this question, where is my hope? Where, where do you place your hope? See, listen to this, darkness is all around me, Job says, thick, impenetrable darkness is everywhere. And there are mornings, guys, when I wake up, if I'm dumb enough to check my newsfeed, that's what I feel like. <laughs> darkness is everywhere. And God goes, really? <laughs> I'm still here. I'm still on the throne. I still have a plan. It looks bleak, it looks dark, but I am with you. But he felt like, Job felt like the darkness was prevailing and there are mornings I wake up and that's exactly how I feel. So where did Job turn? What did he say? What are the words that came out of his mouth? How did he say things that reflect his theology? Now he, again, says some things that are dicey, but if you go through those 19 chapters, you're gonna see that he does have a pretty solid theology because he keeps going back to the only thing he knows he can trust in, God. Can't trust his friends, doesn't have any money, doesn't have a rep reputation, can't go to the bank and borrow. He, he's, he's got nothing. Really, all he has is his wife, the one who said, curse God and die. That's all he's got. Not exactly a positive thing. But what does he do? He prays. This, to me, speaks volumes about his view of God. He prays over and over again. He just talks to God. He complains to God, he grouses at God, he weeps with God, he begs God, he pleads with God. He's honest, he's blunt, he just lets it all out. It's that verbal vomit, just tell him what you think because he already knows before the words come out of your mouth, he knows what's in your brain, so just say it and share it with him. This guy does it and he's the only one who does it. I love the fact that he doesn't pull punches. He didn't, he didn't go, well, God, I, oh, wait, let me sanitize this. Let me, let, let me clean it up because I don't want to offend you. And God's like, you've already thought it. So just say it. I know it's in your heart, so let it come out of your mouth and then we'll deal with it. What he does in these prayers is over and over again, he wants answers and he wants acquittal. Prove me innocent. You're all I got. You're my only hope. I, I need some answers and I need to be acquitted he'll get half of that equation solved. 
He'll never get the answers he's looking for, but he will get acquitted. Look at what he says. These are prayers. Oh God, remember that my life is but a breath and I will never again feel happiness. Lord, I love this because he's, you know, God's like, really? Your life is but a breath? I didn't know that. He's just saying, "I, I feel like my life is about to vaporize. I feel like I'm about to go to the grave. He says it over and over again. He says, I'll never get to feel happiness again. If anything, I, I, I can almost picture God weeping. You know, oh, I wish you would trust me. I wish you believed in me like you need to believe in me. I wish you would understand just how much I love you and what I've got planned for you. But what does Job say? Why won't you leave me alone? Who's he talking to? God. I wish you'd leave me alone at least long enough for me to swallow. Relent, pull back, hold off, take a breath, God, take a break. Give me some slack here. Leave me alone. What, a, what an incredible thing to say to God. But, but again, God can handle our honesty. And he wants us to be honest. He goes on and says, you formed me with your hands. You made me, yet now you completely destroy me. See, that's that conflict in his heart. He goes, you're the one who crafted me, made me, created me. And now I feel like you're trying to destroy me. I don't get it. And, and it's okay to say it. He says, you witness against me, God. You pour out your growing anger on me and bring fresh armies against me. One of the things he realizes, whether he realizes it perfectly or not, is that everything comes from the hand of God, the good and even the bad. Because his God, as far as he can tell, is in control, control of all things. So he goes, this has to be coming from you. He has no concept of Satan, no concept of spiritual warfare, All he can figure out is that the good and the bad all come from God Almighty. So why? Why is this happening? See, one of the things I noticed in in his prayers is that two things are true at once. He's struggling with unbelief. He's praying to God, but he's still wrestling with why. Why not? When? How? What are you gonna do? And then his difficulties are, defying what he believes, his doctrine, right? I don't understand. This isn't how I thought it was gonna be. This doesn't make sense. And so he's unbelief, unbelieving at some point, still talking to God, but doesn't believe because he says when and how and why not? What's going on? And it contradicts, everything he's experienced contradicts what he knows about God, what he understands about God, yet he doesn't stop believing in God. I love this part. That, that, and I've seen this in my life, guys. The older I get, the more I call out to God in the midst of trials, the quicker I call out to God. I, I, I'm beyond the point, well, not beyond the point, but I'm further along that, that I am less likely to try to fix it myself because I'm a lousy God. And I screw up more than I fix. So I'm at the point where I'm like, okay, God, you do it. I, I used to be a do-it-yourselfer and I still do to a, a bit, but I'm at that point in my life, I'd rather pay somebody to do it so I don't have to make eight trips to Home Depot and it still leaks and it still doesn't work. See, this is where God wants to bring you and I. I said, okay, are you gonna finally reach out to me? He struggled, he doubted, but he kept believing. He's down, but he hasn't given up. I love that. That he, that he hadn't thrown in the towel, he hasn't given up on his belief in God. So here's some of the things he says, chapter 13, only grant me two things, then I will not hide myself from your face. Withdraw your hand far from me and do not let dread of you terrify me. I love this. Two things. He basically says, help my unbelief. I believe, but I got some unbelief. I I don't understand, but I want to understand. Help me, show me, guide me. He's got doubts. I have doubts, you have doubts. You're gonna have doubts tomorrow morning. That's okay. Take your doubts to the Lord. As far as he could tell, his good God was assaulting him. Is that a right view? No, it's a wrong view. But he kept calling out to that good God. I don't get it. I don't understand it. As far as I can tell, you're terrorizing me, but you know what? I'm gonna call out to you because you're all I got. I don't have any other hope. I don't have any other help, so I'm gonna call out to you. He says, then call and I will answer. Let me speak and you reply to me. Please, God, speak to me, listen to me. How many are my iniquities and my sins? Tell me, show me. If I've done something wrong, point it out. Make known to me my transgression and my sin. But why do you hide your face and count me as your enemy? 
See, he wants to know. He knows his friends can't help him. He knows only God can help him. So he keeps calling out to God. When you are in the midst of suffering, keep calling out to God. And if you have friends who will do that with you, wonderful. If you have friends who won't, they're not your friends. If you don't have men, other men who will gather with you and say, we're gonna pray with you. I don't know what's going on. I don't know how it's gonna turn out, but you know what? I'm gonna walk with you and pray with you and comfort you. That's, that's what I need in my life. That's what you need in your life. But this guy wants God to show me, give me some answers. Nobody will give me answers. I need you to give me answers. What did I do to offend you, Lord? Tell me. And, and God's not gonna answer any of these questions, but it's okay to ask him. How can I confess what I don't know? When are you going to clue me in? Why are you so angry and silent? See, those are questions you can ask God, but God has a greater answer he wants to give you. And it's, trust me, I can answer that, but there really is no answer for that because there is nothing for him to confess. There is nothing he's done wrong because God has said, you're blameless and upright and you fear me and you turn from evil. So you don't need that answer. What you need to know is that I'm here and I love you and I care for you. He goes on in chapter 17, says, lay down a pledge for me with you. Who is there who will put up a security for me? What's going on here? He knows that he's got no other help and he's calling on God to be my advocate. Remember, we said earlier, his friends who should have been his advocates are now his adversaries. So he says, God, would you post bond for me? Would, would you be there for me? You're not only the judge, the jury and the executioner, but I'm asking you to come alongside and post my bond. I need you to come to my aid. See, if, if, if suffering drives you to this point, then suffering is a good thing. So God never wastes our suffering. This guy has reached the point where he's all alone, he's on his own, he's got nobody else, but what does he say? You must defend my innocence, O God, since no one else will stand up for me. See, ultimately, that's where God wants to get me. That's where he wants to get you is get you to the point where you're gonna turn to him when you're suffering, when you're struggling. He says, since God, you've closed their hearts to understanding who? Job, Eliphaz, Elihu, and Bildad. Since they don't have any understanding, therefore, you will not let them triumph. You will not let them triumph. You're not gonna let them win. I have to turn to you because you're my only hope. You're all I got left. I don't understand, I don't know what you're doing, I don't even like what you're doing, but I'm gonna keep waiting on you, trusting in you. He didn't give up on God. He's under God's curse, as far as he can tell, but he doesn't curse God. That's huge. When you call out to God, you're basically saying, I'm not turning away, I haven't run, I haven't given up, I'm still here, I'm still calling out, I still trust you. Because he knew that the only other option he had was unacceptable. What's the only other op option? Death. If I hope for Sheol as my house, if I make my bed in darkness, if I say to the pit, you are my father, to the worm, you're my sister, where then is my hope? If I get death, there's no hope in that. Remember, he's before the resurrection. He's before salvation through Christ alone. He's before anything about heaven, eternal life. And so for him, all his hope was right here, right now. I can't put my hope in anything else. Where then is my hope? That's the question of the century. Where is your hope? Where is the hope of your lost friends? Where, where is the hope of your family, friends, wife, kids? See, that's the answer we need. Where is our hope? Psalm 146. Blessed is he whose help is, in the, is the God of Jacob, whose hope is in the Lord his God, who made heaven and earth, the sea and all that is in them, who keeps faith, forever, who executes justice for the oppressed, who gives food to the hungry. Now, Job had no clue to this passage because it didn't exist when he was alive. But this is the God he believes in. He's, he's hoping in the Lord. Psalm 71, O Lord, you alone are my hope. I've trusted you, O Lord, from childhood. Yes, you have been with me from birth. From my mother's womb, you have cared for me. No wonder I am always praising you. You alone, O Lord. Is he your hope? See, I love this from Dwayne Garrett. Job is distraught, confused, he still believes in, but he still believes in and invokes God's goodness. When we hurt so badly that we cry out to God in despair and anger, we too should recall and speak of his love as demonstrated in his creation and in the cross. 
For all his distress and outbursts, Job did not lose faith in God's goodness. He continued to hope in God, which reminds me of this old hymn that I remember singing as a kid. Oh God, our help in ages past, our hope for years to come, our shelter from the stormy blast and our eternal home. See, we know something Job doesn't know. We know that suffering ends in glory. We know we're gonna suffer in this life, but we're gonna be glorified in the life to come. He didn't know about that, but we do. So why do we sometimes lack hope? Well, here's your questions for this morning. When you're in need of hope, where do you turn other than God? Why isn't he always your first option? I need you to be brutally honest on this one, guys. Where do you turn for hope? When things go south, what's your immediate go-to? And it, it, it don't, you know, if it's God, wonderful. But I don't think you're being honest because my go-to is usually something other than God. My portfolio, my, my intelligence, I, I turn to something. And then when it fails me, then I turn to God. Where do we turn first for hope? Secondly, how can we make Paul's advice in Romans 12, 12, a regular part of our daily experience? And you need to go and read it together. Finally, Job was brutally blunt with God. Why do some of us find it so hard to be honest if he loves us? See, we, we, we aren't honest because we think he's gonna get angry, but he loves you and he already knows what you're thinking. So why not be honest? Father, I thank you for your word and I thank you for the opportunity to share it with these men. And I pray that as we talk around these tables, that we would wrestle with the fact that we have placed our hope in the wrong things, that we hope in the wrong things, we trust in the wrong things, and, and, and you want us to trust you, and sometimes the suffering that you bring on us personally, that you bring on us as the people of God, and that you bring on this world is a way to get our attention that you're the only hope. And we've discovered that hope, and may we live in that hope, and may we rely on that hope, and tomorrow morning may we bask in that hope that you are a good God who's completely in control and you're working your plan to perfection and we can trust you. And I pray all of this in Jesus Christ's name, amen.